Welcome to our third colloquium of the semester. Um, and um, we're really excited to have Ingrid Robbins, uh, who is uh, coming from the University of Utrecht. And um, I was um, interested to note that her uh, doctorate is actually in economics, although she's very well known uh, and other, I guess, another graduate degree in philosophy. Uh, she's very well known for her uh, work uh, in collaboration with uh, other philosophers, but also on her own with a bunch of important books. She did a lot of work early, uh, earlier, uh, not that early, on the capability approach. Um, she has a book along those lines um, called The Capability Approach. And uh, others are well-being, freedom, and social justice, the capability approach re-examined. Um, and also um, some others, she, her, uh, there's one on gender inequality, the capability perspective, but she doesn't only work in capability theory. Um, she has a wide range of topics that we noted um, aside from well-being and gender inequality, methods and normative political philosophy, climate justice, and um, sort of applied philosophical considerations of universal basic income, inheritance, taxation, and other such uh, important contemporary policy proposals. Um, and her recent work is on the limitarianism and I understand there's a book coming out uh, about that. And um, I, in, I was interested because this is a center for global ethics and politics and seeing whether Ingrid could give a kind of discuss the global import of such a proposal, which is complicated. And so I'm excited to hear what uh, her presentation today, which is entitled Limitarianism from a Global Perspective. Please join me in welcoming Ingrid Robbins. Thank you, Carol, for that uh, very friendly introduction. And uh, indeed, the word limitarianism is horrible. I mean, I've, had, I've encountered so many people who said, so you're working on this thing called limit, what exactly? <laughs> um, so um, yeah, but uh, my publishers insist on having limitarianism on the cover of the book. <laughs> I really feel sorry for the person who has to design, design the cover because it's a long word, but it's not my problem. I'm uh, here to make the arguments and, and then we will see what happens. So I've been working on this question of, so I will first say in one sentence what limitarianism is. It's basically the opposite of saying nobody should be poor. It just means nobody should be too rich. Um, I think it would be nice if all of us would be somewhat rich or rich, but there is a certain limit where I think uh, it becomes an issue of uh, distributive justice, but also other considerations. And I will talk about those uh, in, in this talk briefly, but I will especially ask what does this mean if you are interested in international issues? Because the way I've been working on this question, so for the last five years I've been working on this and I've published a number of more technical philosophical papers um, was by looking at particular aspects of it from theories. So basically you're in political philosophy, there are all these debates. And then from that perspective, you try to uh, see whether what this, pers what this perspective could bring. And for example, there has been a debate about, is this really different from egalitarianism? How does it differ from sufficientarianism? But in the book I'm writing, I'm really not interested in these questions at all. I'm only interested in the question, would this bring something for public debate? So I'm writing what, what people, uh, publishers call a trade book, which means a contribution to public debate. And, um, and that has meant for me, um, so Carol is correct in saying that officially my PhD was in economics, although the truth is it was one third political philosophy, one third welfare economics and one third gender studies. I am really working as a philosopher. And for this trade book, I've been, I had to read a lot of empirical work because the public is not interested in it, how does this relate to John Rawls's theory of justice or to two uh, to threshold uh, sufficientarianism or something like that. And that's also what I will uh, present to you. 
um, today. So now we will see, yeah, we'll, let, thanks for starting the PowerPoint. Yeah, it will, it will be, it will be fine. And I'm uh, taking the occasion to say hello to the people who are, who are zooming in. I don't know where you are, I can't see you, but I'm glad you're there. Okay, so limitarianism, let me first just give you uh, a sort of a, a, an introductory definition. Uh, it's at the, at the general abstract level, it's a view that says that there should be an upper limit to how much of a scarce and valuable resource a person can have. Scarce and valuable resource can also be something else than money. It could be something like um, the, the um, ability to emit greenhouse gases, or in case there's water scarcity, it could be water. It could be other things too, but I will focus only on uh, economic limitarianism and hence talk about wealth and income. And hence what limitarianism then means is what in, in uh, public debate um, has been, one could say it has been summarized as nobody should be super rich. In the US in particular, there has been this saying, nobody should be a billionaire, but I would not put the limitarian threshold at a billion. I think that's way too high. Now, this is both an ideal, just like the eradication of poverty is an ideal, but it is also a work in progress. So I think, um, of course, whether it's an ide ideal that you should subscribe to is a different question. You can reject the ideal. Mm -hmm. But uh, as work in pro progress, I think it's important to also see that you could have it in a political version and in a voluntaristic version. And that's, that actually makes a big difference because a political version uh, would mean that somehow either by changing labor laws or changing all sorts of laws and especially the fiscal system, you would basically reduce inequalities from the top. If it's voluntaristic, it would just, it would mean that you're going to encourage um, we, people who have more money than above uh, the limit to give it away. And that actually is a, a very big uh, debate uh, uh, which of those models one should um, endorse and what the consequences are of those models. Um, so what is extreme wealth? What is now here? You all know this. Forbes has a, has a, um, a list, the billionaires list, and every day they updated it. This is the, this is the list from today. Actually, I see that Bernard Arnault uh, must be happy because he's climbing up the list. Um, but these are, of course, uh, so uh, Elon Musk here has 196 uh, billion dollars. Earlier this year, he had 220, it really doesn't matter. So <laughs> in the sense that, of course, it does matter because that means it's a difference of 30 billion and you can do a lot of good things with 30 billion. But the, this is just basically, when you start at the top, where do you start at uh, looking at extreme wealth? I, we can have a debate in the in the Q and A and the discussion part on where this threshold is. And of course, that's important because suppose I say let's put a threshold at fifty thousand dollars. Well, then I think everybody's going to say no. <laughs> this is crazy. If I, if I say let's put it at 15 billion, then many people are going to say it has no political, uh, it has no impact. So the, the issue of the threshold is important, but um, the way I, I develop this is by saying you should actually have a set of, um, it's almost like basic rights, human rights that you can, uh, that you can um, enjoy. And you should also be able to have a really flourishing life. But I think, and this is really where it becomes intersubjective and hence political. Um, I think that, for example, being able to um, uh, enjoy um, a leisure activity or enjoy some, some, join a sports team or practice some music is part of a flourishing life. But, um, but it's, but um, say going on a, on a international holiday twice a year, 
I don't think that's necessarily part of a flourishing life. And these are then the kind of debates that you have. So one of the things I think that is unavoidable is that if one goes into this discussion, one ends up with having to have a discussion about um, accounts of flourishing or accounts of objective uh, well-being um, lists. Um, uh oh, technology is letting us down. Yeah, okay, I can try again, but yeah. Yeah, okay, so let me then say something, just I will I will speed up a bit because we want to have enough time to come to the international and global um, dimensions of this. So let me just give you a few data um, to just give you a sense of how inequalities in the US are, because the way I've set up the presentation is, I start from the US and then I ask, what, to what extent does this have global dimensions? So here you see the uh, change in the income, um, the CO to workers' compensation ratio, how it changed from 65 to the year, uh, to recent years. And in the 60s, the ratio was 20 to one. So the CEO earned 20 times what uh, the average worker earned. It climbed uh, in the 80s and it, now it has peaked. So peaked around 2000 at 396 and now it's around the 270. So, uh, and this kind of the picture you get here that in the, in the 60s and the 70s, it was low then it increased and it has now accelerated. You find that for all forms of uh, financial inequalities and to just give you the broad brushes, the US is in the worst position. Inequalities in the US are really by far uh, the biggest, especially also because the amounts are so, so uh, large. So interestingly, the country where I live, the Netherlands, has the second biggest wealth inequality in the world, but the amounts are much smaller. So our super rich people cannot, for example, um, also for, for other reasons, they can't buy themselves into politics because they have said they would have, actually, I think that people who are billionaires, it might be um, perhaps two or three. Um, I, so the most have like say a few hundred millions that these are our rich people. Whereas in the US, it's really a different so the power they have is much uh, bigger. So uh, if you're interested in questions about wealth inequalities, I really recommend having a look at the Fed's distribution of financial accounts, which is a relatively recent data source that goes back a long uh, way in, um, uh, his, well, a long way, <laughs> several decades, uh, and, and looks at the distribution of wealth and you can uh, look at it for different um, percentiles. You can look at it for racial categories and so forth. And so this is how it is now. The bottom half of the population has 2.8% of all wealth in the US. Uh, then the next 40%, let's just call them the middle classes, have 28%. And the top 10 has 68%. And if you then split that up, uh, you see that of that 10%, the first nine have almost 37%. Then there is 0.9% uh, that has 31%. And then there is this one in a thousand of Americans who together have 12%. So this is incredibly skewed. And that means, of course, that the numbers we're also talking about when you talk about uh, the top 1% are really uh, um, large uh, numbers. And here you see how this has changed. I'll go through this quickly, but I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with anybody who wants to see it. So you can see that the uh, bottom 50% since uh, 1998, which is when they, I think actually, it, I think they may have older data, but I'm not entirely sure. It um, decreased a little bit. Of course, one could say, oh, but it increased from 3.8 to 2.8%, but it's half of the population that lost like uh, a quarter of what they had. And then the middle class is also lost. And you just see that uh, the top 10% and in particular, the top 1% uh, uh, significantly increased how much um, they had. That pattern 
is in many countries. Uh, so that is not unique to the United States. Uh, here you see uh, how I like these kind of visualizations because for me it works in like one, in one figure you can just see what, what happens. So the red line is the US, the blue lines are, the, are Europe. And what you have here is, so let's look at the red lines. Um, on top, the top red line with the cubes is how much does the richest 10% of the US have of um, all private property. And you can see that around the 1900, when inequality was also very high, they had 80%. It declined and it declined, especially uh, um, around uh, the 30s, 40s of the last century. It was a bit stable. And since the end of the 1970s, that's like the period when it changed, it increased again. And you see the reverse for the 40%, which is this, this line. And here you see that the people, the 50, so this is half of the population, this line, they really are just stuck at nothing. And there you do see a bit of a difference between um, Europe and the US because the blue lines, which is Europe, are closer to each other, which means uh, less unequal. Um, and yeah, I still think in Europe, the the top, uh, the bottom fifty percent has has still very very little, but they seem to have at least something. Okay, now this is just one slide to also show that in the U.S. this is not surprisingly uh, deeply racialized, because um, the um, I have the I digged up the figures about from the census. Let me just you probably know this by heart, but I don't. Um, 13.6% of the US population would be um, black or African-Americans, and they have 4.5% of wealth. And the Hispanic or Latino are, uh, according to the census data that I found, 19% and they have 2.7% of wealth. And then of course, the well, the white people have, uh, are, um, I don't see the, the numbers here, but they are, uh, roughly like, I don't know, 60% or something, and they have 83% um, of wealth. So there is also uh, a racial dimension to this. I put gender in quite, with a question mark because these, these statistics are at a household level. Many households have male and female members. That makes it complicated. Uh, and this is something on which I want to work uh, in the future to see to what extent we have information on this. Um, yeah, here you see one of the main reasons why we got into this situation. These are the tax rates. Just look at the, at the um, so the, the orange one is the tax rate on the richest 0.1%, uh, and the purple one is the richest 0.1%. And here you have the people who are 90% of the population. So what we see between 1910 and the current data the current year is that the um, the um, taxation rates for basically the ninety percent of the people increased from uh, the effective tax rate increased from less than ten percent to close to thirty percent, and for the um, the rich and the very rich, it increased over at the beginning of the last century, and then it was it fluctuated a bit, and since the seventies, well, actually a bit earlier already, it went down and now basically everybody is paying, this, paying the same effective tax rate. Ah, okay, good. Oh, I... <laughs> I will need your help. <laughs> okay, so why care? Why do we care about what, what, whether there are inequalities and what rich people have? Well, and this, what I... Um, what I'm giving you here is basically in one slide, the summary of six chapters of my book. So this will be uh, unavoidably extremely brief and brusque, but I would just want to tell you the scope of the problem. So the first is that many of these uh, processes that led to this accumulated wealth, actually the processes themselves were immoral. 
I mean, I think slavery is a very clear example. So if you were to think about how um, those processes led to those that actually were involved in immoral activities to have more and those who were victims to have less, um, and that hasn't been rectified, that's one source. But also, for example, there has recently uh, a journalist has written a book how some of the most wealthy German uh, uh, families were involved in activities in uh, during the the uh, Nazi uh, area, and there are more examples. Um, I mean, you, there are also specific cases like say Bhopal. I don't know whether Bhopal rings a bell for those of you who are younger than 50, <laughs> but uh, Bhopal was, a, well, I would just say Google it. It's really a scan, scandalous uh, thing that happened in India where uh, an American company, um, uh, was responsible, well, well, was at least partially responsible, but I think um, as a company, they were also liable to uh, big, uh, the biggest chemical disaster. And if you read up on uh, how little compensation the people got who were the victims, uh, and also how basically geopolitical means were used to um, be able to get away with this, there's just many, many of these examples. Now, the second reason is, and this is the most, you could say, philosophical, well, I think it's a, a sort of a philosophical reason which has to do with how we look at human beings, is that, and I, I think this is a one that will be contested by some people, but my argument is, and I'm absolutely not the first person to argue this and also not the last, much of what we get in life is due to luck. So if you start to think about uh, people who are successful, where were they born, who were their parents, what were their innate talents, and so on. All these factors, they cannot say that they can uh, claim this as their own, um, as a part of their own merit. Of course, if one takes this to the extreme, one goes into what philosophers call full determinism, and then one could say that as purely as a matter of justice, there should be strict equality. I think that conclusion is too strong because it basically, it, it takes away personhood. So we would become sort of machines of pure machines of luck. So I think one has to find somewhere in, somewhere in between, but, but, um, the, um, but if one has a sort of a self-reflective attitude about how much in life is actually due to circumstances beyond one's control, uh, then that is actually a lot. And people who are who are successful in life should count their blessings rather than um, tell themselves that they deserve their fortunes. Um, uh, the third reason is, um, is a form of consequentialism that if you have, that basically it says that the um, additional, uh, so the marginal, utility or whatever you plug in there, an account of quality of life of additional money uh, goes down. So the more you have, the less you can additionally do with it. Um, and then um, at some point, really you are spending, you spending your money either on just further, further accumulating. So there are scholars who say that this is actually the driving force of certain of decisions once one reaches a certain point that it's really further capital accumulation, but also one could uh, engage in, um, in status driven uh, spending, which is not, um, well, it's, I don't think one should, should consider this as an urgent need if, uh, if there are actually genuine issues in society. And I think, Effective, uh, effective altruism, which is much debated these days with the, let's call it the adventures of uh, Sam Bankman fried is uh, a version of tree, but I think a quite radical version. One doesn't have to be, go all the way. Um, the fourth one is unfortunately very relevant for the US and that is that wealth concentrations undermines democratic values. I mean, you're political philosophers and political scientists, so I'm not gonna dwell on this, uh, but, one of the reasons why I think we are more lucky in Europe to um, have less of a problem with this is that we have more strict uh, rules about uh, campaign spending. 
it's really very low amounts. You can, in some countries, you can only spend like $2,000 and not more. Imagine this. Um, and then uh, five, uh, sort of fifth reason is that, um, that we are in, uh, not just in a climate emergency, but also in a biodiversity emergency. And it's the lifestyles that go with being very rich just uh, are incompatible with, uh, with what ecological sustainability demands from us. And then the sixth one, which is where some of my, my colleagues says, I don't care, but I do think it's a relevant argument, is that there's also arguments based on say psychology that actually it doesn't really make the rich happy themselves. And one of the interesting things I've been doing for this book is I've also been speaking with rich people, with family members of rich people, with people who took radical decisions and gave away their money, with financial advisors, with philanthropists. And of course, I'm speaking with a biased group because some of them do not want to speak to me. <laughs> but um, many of them actually say they, are, they feel liberated, that they gave away their money or that they made certain decisions. Um, so I, these are all these reasons. Now, that's what I have been doing, working all of these out over the last years. And you would say, well, but you know, these are, this seems to be nothing global or international about this, except of course for the unmet urgent needs, because uh, in poor countries, there are many more unmet urgent needs than in rich countries. So, and then you see, if you think about the kind of solutions that are often proposed, they tend to be domestic solutions, domestic in the sense, in the sense of in one's country. So for example, I mean, if one translates libertarianism into a fiscal policy, it would mean if one does it all the way and not as a gradual scheme, it would mean that one would have a highest marginal tax rate of 100%. I should say, I'm not thinking where this is gonna happen anytime soon, but we did have in some countries, including here, we did have highest, highest marginal tax rates of 80% uh, in the last century. And that would of course get us already a long way um, to uh, reducing inequalities. But that is everything that's fiscal is seen as uh, either at the state level or national. Um, the same for fiscal loopholes. Um, there are, uh, there's a very interesting book written by uh, an activist group called uh, the Patriotic Millionaires. Have you heard of them? Yeah, so the Patriotic Millionaires are millionaires who argue for higher minimum wage, uh, more taxation on the rich and the very rich, and um, change of the democratic system to protect democracy from the influence of, uh, of finance. And uh, they've written a book which basically chapter after chapter describes another wave of uh, changes that were made in the law, which made it possible for rich people to dodge taxes. And you just, chapter after chapter, you just see, okay, here's another proposal and another way whereby you could say, well, the highest uh, marginal income, uh, the highest uh, marginal tax rate on income may be, and then you give a number, but actually there are all these loopholes, which means that effectively uh, those who are able to make use of those loopholes who have financial advisors pay much less. And also the other strategy, which is not fiscal, but which starts to do something at the beginning, namely what we call pre-distributive measures, such as uh, strengthening the labor unions or changing labor laws, they all tend to be domestic. So then the question is, is this just a domestic program or domestic idea? And um, if so, then is this possible? because in the end, uh, the world is uh, connected and the economies are globalized. So that's a challenge. If fiscal systems are national, then is libertarianism a domestic project? And if not, what are the international dimensions? And one could, for example, ask if one is, uh, since we started with the data for the US, does it matter to other countries that the US has very large inequalities and massive wealth concentration? So I will give you five reasons. There may be more. These were, I mean, uh, otherwise we will not have time for debate. So I will just stick to those five. So the first is one which comes from sociology. 
where a, a group of scholars have been writing books on what they call the transnational capitalist class. Um, and they uh, argue that, so this is basically um, research that, that looks into elite structures of elites. And they've been arguing that um, the people who make up this, who make up basically uh, the highest class are also internationally connected. And uh, they will basically try to um, influence a law, lobby and so forth to make it for them possible to do more active business. And they also share a set of value and they share connections. So I will, I, there, there's somebody who wrote about this. One of the first people was Leslie Sklar, who is British. Peter Phillips has recently, he's American. He has recently written a book called uh, Giants, where he basically says, okay, here are the 17 biggest uh, financial organizations, private equity firms, et cetera. And here is uh, the board from the WTO and the World Bank. And here you have the WEF, the, yeah, WEF. Do I say this correctly? Yeah, anyway. So, um, and then he lists the people who are there and he lists how they know each other. And you could do sort of network analysis and just see that they are linked. But of course, that doesn't really. So, what does that prove? So, of course, but then, and so that's why what I've, what I've kind of come to appreciate much more as an academic is what investigative journalism can do that we cannot do. And in this case, there's a very uh, interesting and deeply upsetting book by uh, Peter Goodman, who is a journalist or correspondent for the New York Times. It's called The Man. And he just describes for a number of these people what they exactly did to make the rules as they wanted them to be. And, um, I should say when I was starting to read up on this literature, I felt very uncomfortable because I was feeling I was entering the terrain of possible conspiracy theories. Because you just start to think, okay, there are these people who sort of rule us. And of course, it's not like that, strictly speaking. And I should also say the reason why I'm really worried about this is because uh, I don't know how it is here in the US at this moment, but in Europe, this is the trope that the uh, populist and extreme right uh, um, use, they connect it with uh, rule of choose, and then it becomes an anti-Semitic populist, anti-elite uh, conspiracy theory. That's what it is. So this really makes it, I think, important to be really careful about um, what exactly is being claimed, but there is something deeply paradoxical about this because because of the actions of the people who try to basically um, enlarge the possibilities for capital to further accumulate, they undermine democratic processes. They create a form of globalization which is beneficial for those who have capital and uh, disadvantageous for those who only have labor. Inequalities increase. Uh, trust in dem democracies decreases. This is a fertile ground for populists, and hence they will then say uh, that, um, that we should have strong leaders and 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 so on. So there is a difference between being anti-globalist, any type of globalism, versus anti-globalism in the form in which we have it now, and that is difficult to 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 um, to tease that out because often people are just anti-globalist, full stop. We will come back to this because the, the fifth argument is all about the form of globalism. I should say that I don't, I also don't think it's just about people. It's, I mean, I, what I think is good about this literature that is that it, it's, I mean, often some, some literature talks about capitalism does this and capitalism does that. And for me being trained in mainstream economics and in analytical political philosophy, I find this difficult because who is capitalism? Well, here you have the phase of capitalism. In Peter Phillips's book, he lists 199 people who are in the driving seat of international capitalism. So then it becomes also, um, you don't have to subscribe to um, um, units that you may, as a scholar, 
not feel comfortable with because they don't fit with the kind of paradigm you work in. But I don't think, even if I think that this, this turn into making the actors more visible is good, I don't think this is the whole story. Because what is also important is, and that's acknowledged in much of the literature that I read, is that the ideas changed. So in the um, 70s, um, there were, of course, thinkers like uh, Friedrich von Hayek and Milton Friedman who started to um, yeah, propagate. I don't know what I can use that word, but I think it's still probably correct or spread ideas that we later have come to call um, neoliberalism. And one of the examples is the shift in how uh, CEOs and company and firm owners see themselves namely as embedded in a local situation where they, where they have uh, duties towards employees, towards shareholders or those who own the capital, towards clients, towards the community. And now this basically has moved into much more sharehold, um, yeah, shareholder focused um, forms of um, um, doing business. Okay, so the second uh, international dimension of, um, of the Limitarian project and this question about the power and the situation of the most rich is that, um, of course, in this question about tainted money and the fact that one should, that some of the money actually is, um, was acquired by way of morally legitimate means, this has international dimensions. Uh, so, I mean, colonialism is of course the most obvious uh, example, but I think the current uh, situation with climate change is also a very good example because um, the it's not just the richest countries, but, but even more so the richest people within those countries, although also actually very rich people in, in developing countries, they emit so much more than those who are emitting very little, but are the first victims of climate change. So, um, and also there are some industries, all the industries that make use of uh, fossil fuels as a basis of what they produce, uh, where they have known for a very long time that actually their production, their way of producing was causing these greenhouse gas emissions and that this was leading to climate change and that this would lead to all these harms to people and other species. And uh, still they have, uh, this, so basically this means that their profits were always to some extent based on uh, ecological, um, um, yeah, so economists call these negative externalities. So they should have really paid a price for the ecological harm they did and uh, they didn't, which means that those profits were uh, too big. Um, yeah, so I think this actually has a, a really big um, international dimension, especially the case also of climate. And we can discuss that further if you're interested. And then we come to how the fiscal rules are internationally connected. So domestic fiscal dumping harms other countries. How does that work? Now we know that um, this is what we are always told and which, which is to a large extent true, Capital is mobile, labor is not because we have borders. And hence, capital can always threaten to move across borders if it doesn't get its demands met. We had a very interesting example of that in my country last year when um, the, so we always have coalitions. We have, I think, I don't know, but we have probably like eight political parties. <laughs> so one, the smallest one has one seat, but the biggest one, which is a sort of, conservative center-right party, they had, um, they are closest to uh, businesses and they also are often seen as the party for uh, business leaders. And they had, um, without putting it into their electoral uh, manifesto, they had at some point decided we're going to abolish dividend taxation. There was a huge protest in the country because I mean, they were elected without saying that this was what they're going to do. And in any case, there were these debates about growing inequality and that um, they that entrepreneurs have already so many, they get all sorts of subsidies. Uh, so there was a big resistance 
also in the other coalition parties. So there was a lot of hassle and then they had to drop it. And then uh, not soon, well, soon after Shell, which was originally a Dutch company and then became Dutch uh, British, announced that it would move its headquarters to England, to London. Of course, the reasons they gave was because they wanted to harmonize the way they did their bookkeeping and it was easier to have that in one fiscal system. But um, in an interview, uh, Ben van Beurde also said, yeah, the climate in the Netherlands has become anti-entrepreneurial. So these are of course, uh, and, and, and I, I am aware that this is tricky because on the one, you, it's not as if you have, you have proof. You will not have proof. It's just like we have, for example, uh, uh, an extreme right wing. Uh, well, I, I am afraid I have to say a uh, proto-fascist party. Everybody thinks that party has received money from Putin, but we don't know. How can you know? Well, by definition, except if somebody leaks information, you will not know. And the same, I think, is happening with much of these, uh, this kind of in, uh, implicit lobbying, which makes it, I think, tricky for scholars because you don't want to start um, also believing things that may not be true, but sometimes you just don't know what is true. Um, now, it is the case that international uh, coordination or the willingness to tax profit from companies that are not taxed in their home countries um, can solve this issue to, to some extent. So uh, Saez and Sukman, uh, um, who have written uh, this book, uh, The Triumph of Injustice, which I'm sure you all uh, heard about, they have not only an analysis of everything that is problematic, but also some proposed solutions. And one of them is international coordination on this, but also if that doesn't happen soon, um, to, they say you could um, uh, tax countries that are unwilling to, co to collaborate in international co cooperation by uh, just saying, okay, you sell in my country 20% of your products, we're just gonna tax you for 20% of your product of your profits in our country. And they describe that this is actually already a mechanism that happens between US states. So there are state level uh, type of these taxes. So uh, um, this is something that works at another level, but they propose this as a, as a strategy. And of course, if these kind of measures were taken, then, um, then uh, capital can, capital if it's taxed, it can no longer just say, we move to another country, which now happens, uh, unfortunately, pretty strongly. Okay, and now comes an, an, uh, one that, that I, I see I need to, the last one is gonna be quick, but this one is a bit longer because this is a, a, a tricky one. And that is, if we talk about um, how to divide up what employers and employees together produce, um, so uh, this is often called uh, the social products. Um, we talk about this in a country. So we talk about shouldn't Jeff Bezos raise the wages of his, of his uh, workers. But the structure of that argument can also apply internationally. And then when you talk internationally, it's really about uh, producing in other countries and trade. And uh, the roughly the mainstream economic story is that globalization is a good thing because you have uh, different uh, different um, um, strengths and uh, there are gains from trade to be made. And hence you can reduce poverty in the global south and global inequality. When I studied economics, although I should say this is now 20 years ago or longer, uh, I just only remember globalization was just an economic integration was only positive. There was just no uh, critical question to be asked. But I think we should ask the question, how are these gains from trade divided between these different countries? It's just like you have employers and employees, you have to ask the rich country and the poorer country, how do they divide up uh, those profits? And um, we can say that poverty and inequality have reduced, 
But actually, that is not necessarily the right thing to just be contented with. We can also ask how much could it have reduced? So here's a graph that I think many of you will have seen. It's from um, an Oxford-based group called Our World in Data. And uh, this graph has become famous because uh, people like Bill Gates have uh, um, promoted this kind of work because it's a positive story. This is namely the number of uh, people living in extreme poverty as defined by the international organizations. And you can just see that over the last 100 years, the number of people living in extreme poverty, according to this data, has dramatically decreased. Now, there has been discussion with all sorts of development economists about the value of this kind of statistics. Um, but, um, and then this organization, world, Our World in Data, also points out that this international poverty line is actually very low. But another, and I think more important question is, how much better is this picture? And what were other possible distributions that were possible. So we shouldn't just be contented as you often hear with saying, you see, poverty reduces. So globalization is good for poor, poor people and capitalism works. I'm now uh, putting it a bit uh, um, slogan-esque, but that's what you often hear people saying. And they are, of course, they are right in when they say poverty has reduced, at least on that metric because there's also debates about those metrics. But there are uh, other questions we should ask. And there is a very interesting blog post by Jason Hickel that just makes this extremely clear. So I want to show this to you. So this is a graph you've probably seen. It's from, uh, it was originally from uh, Branko Milanovic and, an, and a co-author of his, it's called The Elephant. And it's how income has uh, changed for different income groups, so deciles. Um, between eight, 1980 and 2016. And this is all in the context of debates about what has globalization done to us, because that's a big debate. And here you'd see that, of course, the, the, the poorest groups that actually got the, the biggest uh, gay change, positive change in income, the middle groups less. And then there's this little group that has a bit, uh, all, the, the best, the the richest also have some um, positive income change, but actually the big thing that, that we see is that the poorest really gained uh, most. But what if you put this not in, this is the same data. This is exactly the same data, but instead of increases, it's about absolute numbers. And of course, if you have $1 a day and you move from one to two, you have a 100% increase. And this just shows that the gains from globalization were massively uh, reaped by the, by the, well, yeah, the 1% really, and then a bit about the, the top 10. And that is really in all the different studies that are reached in different disciplines, different countries, that pattern is pretty persistent. I should say, I don't read on all countries. I mean, the OECD countries and the countries in which I found uh, material. And that, is, and that then just shows, because if you see this graph, you say, well, that's extremely unequal. We could have divided this differently. Why don't we turn it around and we give the 10%, we just make it like this. That had also been a possible way to say there everybody gains from globalization, but those who have least, we're gonna give more, most. And that was not what happened. So that I think is very important to, um, to realize because this, what you just saw is what really, what uh, egalitarians and limitarians really object to, that those that already have so much, then when we do something collaboratively, collaboratively get most. Um, and then uh, Hickel with co-authors uh, have, have uh, um, made calculations on these, what they call unequal global exchanges. What actually is, are the numbers? And uh, this is a literature in development economics, which, uh, and it's a uh, heterodox, so it's contested by um, mainstream economists or, or <laughs> by many or 
yeah, I think many of them. Uh, it says that so so the, the standard uh, or a, a dominant account of uh, global development is that domestic institutions determine whether uh, you will develop. If you have a corrupt government, if you don't have infrastructure, if you don't have protection of inter of property rights, etc., you're not going to develop. And this alternative view says no, but really there, although that may be true, there is there are other things and that have more to do with international power relations. I'm now um, summarizing it because I see that my time is up and I want to keep enough time for discussion. So what they calculated is that um, they don't exactly say the global south and the global north because Russia and some Eastern European countries were for them included under what they call periphery or semi-periphery, that they lost, uh, in say one year, they lost $2.2 trillion due to unequal exchange. And the unequal exchange, they fill that in with, uh, they plug in a certain, um, a certain uh, proxy for what then would be equal exchange. And that of course can be contested. And they also say this, they say what would be equal exchange is something that should be debated. Uh, but they defend their, uh, and they also, they defend their the choices that they make, and they also refer to other studies that have also, I mean, other numbers, but all very, very uh, sizable numbers. And for the period uh, between 1960 and to, to 2017, they say that the, the periphery, the global south and some other countries lost $26 trillion which would be equivalent to 97% of their GDP. Let's assume, because I am at least not, not capable to judge the technical details of their study. So I must um, accept that this has been peer reviewed and that I can read it and I, it seems like um, solid research to me. So let's assume that this is correct. Then this just shows that there is a huge way in which this could have been divided differently. Uh, and what they, what I, what I found a really uh, interesting quote is they say, unequal exchange represents a loss for the South, but it is not a lo loss relative to being excluded from the world economy, because that's what always been said that the global South benefits from globalization. Rather, it is a loss relative to an alternative world of fair trade, or you could even say fairer trade. Okay, let me come to the last one then. Um, and I, I should, of course, I'm making some shortcuts because I, I uh, put so much material on the slides, but what this of course means is that if we had fair trade, our, well, actually probably all of us, but um, definitely our super rich people would have had much less. Um, so the last way in which uh, the question about domestic measures for limitarianism or for egalitarianism and the international dimensions are connected is that, um, uh, and this, has been, this is described in detail in this book by Saez and Zuckman, is that um, international, um, that multinational companies have increasingly done something that's called international profit shifting. So the way it works is in a nutshell like this, you have a multinational, you split it up, or actually you may first have a national company, you split it up in different units, and then you, and then you basically put certain of those units, not necessarily physical, but legally, in countries that have uh, tax schemes that are, if you take the combination, are most beneficial. And then these different units can, units can uh, um, sent each other bills for certain things. So for example, using a, a trademark, you, you can then have flows of profit, no flows of cost accounting and hence ultimately also of profit between those different parts of your multinational. And then you can do fiscal optimization and you can make sure that in countries where there is, for example, a corporate uh, tax, you have as little profit as possible. And in countries where there's no corporate tax, like Bermuda, you have all the profits. And, um, and what they say is that, um, 
They call this a war of all multinationals against the states. I always find this so funny because economists don't normally use this kind of language. But uh, that, I mean, if they say, they are very careful in what they say. They really are careful in what they, what they uh, the kind of conclusions that they draw and they want us to really take time to look at the details. But then this is one of their conclusions. They say that <clears throat> on average, 40% of all profits are shifted to these offshore tax havens. <clears throat> and the US is the winner with 60%. I think if you combine uh, this with the unequal trade relations, you end up with a form of globalization that is deeply plutocratic. And that, and then here I have at the end the problem that I already indicated that is you need, you need policy changes to address this, but in order for them to be addressed, you need politicians who are not indebted to those who funded their campaigns, so who are, have their hands free from corporate influence, um, but, and that is, that is, so it's a bit of a, where do you start to solve this problem? Um, and at the same time, I think if we don't start it, we really have a problem of increasing populist uh, threat as, um, I think, uh, here you had with Trump and in Europe, we have increasingly with, uh, right-wing parties. In conclusion, I haven't argued for the first thing, but I will argue at length in my book that the super rich do not want, to want us to talk about inequality. And they typically want to focus on win-win situations like poverty goes down or on technological solutions. And they generally also don't want to talk about how, how money corrupts politics. Um, and this is why I think we need to really talk about capping and all the other reasons why we need to talk about capping uh, how much money people have. And also see this as a distributive justice question and not just a question about should they engage in philanthropy. It is definitely a domestic problem. You can see this, for example, by looking at in the case of how uh, money corrupts politics, comparing the US with other countries. Um, and hence, you need domestic laws, for example, to increase minimum wage, to protect labor, to have the right to unionize and so forth. But in addition, there's also an international and a global dimension, uh, both in the consequences that this accumulated wealth has, as well in, uh, in how that wealth was accumulated. So I think we must, for all the domestic redistribu redistributive movements, and also for theorists who develop views, I think we must keep those international dimensions in mind. And I'm very glad that I could come here to speak because I wasn't so aware myself of the international dimensions until Carol said, can you talk about the global dimensions of limitarianism? So thanks again. And uh, I'm looking forward to your um, to discussion. Um, thank you, um, Ingrid. I, I love this talk. I agree with everything you said about, um, and yeah, I just really appreciate a lot of the insights. I just have a question, um, which is, so I really agreed with all the problems that you identified. I have a question about like whether under our non-ideal conditions, limitarianism is a solution to those problems. Um, because one of the things that occurred to me in thinking about this, um, and if, this is gonna sound like I'm a fan of philanthropy in the global South, but I think, Everybody in this room knows I am not. But my worry is that, like, I mean, if we're choosing between limitarianism and reforming the global economic order, my worry about limitarianism is that it, since most aid in the U by the U.S. is given to serve its geopolitical interests, that using taxation as the lever to pull here might actually end up having unintended other kinds of bad consequences in the global south. So I don't expect you to have like a complete solution to this, but I just wondered whether it's something you've thought about and you have any thoughts about yeah. it. Yeah, no, so that that's a great question because there is really this worry about, um, what's the expression? The cart and the horse? Yeah. But whether it's the ro <laughs> whether it's really having the problem in, and so I do think uh, it's actually, I think it's a valid objection. 
um, if one thinks at limitarianism as at the surface and doesn't look at why we should need this. And I think, of course, and that's also <clears throat> what in some of the philosophical discussions has been said, that, um, well, if you have egalitarianism or sufficientarianism, don't you then have everything you need? But I think actually egalitarianism, it's it can mean very different things. And I think on one version, it's too weak. It's just formalistic and equality of opportunities that are not substantive. And if it's equality of outcomes, I think it's too demanding. So I, I what I think that limitarianism does in is it, um, it can do several different things. Is one, it can, uh, I, I'm hoping, <laughs> provoke to get a discussion going. Of course, there is already a discussion. I'm just trying to give a little more push to have this discussion. Uh, and uh, also to, um, um, and then of course, e various types of egalitarians and, and limitarians, they're all, they are all in the joint in the same, they have the same uh, values that they want to endorse or that they want to strive for. And uh, but also I think um there are people like um take I think the example that I of which I of whom I know the the data best is uh uh GK Rowling, who's a billionaire, who um well I, we are not going to talk now about her views on on trans people, but when it concerns money, she was of course single mother on welfare. She's giving a lot of charity, etc. So people could ask, well, why? What did she do wrong that she cannot have that money? Huh. Well, and there I really think limitarians bring something in, which is you just don't need it. You just don't need it. Mm -hmm. And there's all these people who yeah. do need it. And that I think is something where I actually think the effective altruists, although I think they are too demanding and also have some other problems, have a point. Uh, so it, it is a bit of a different kind of mix of, of considerations. But I have I, I, it is, of course, you're right that um, one should always be careful about unintended uh, consequences. And that's why these underlying values, which is protection of democracy and um, um, ecological uh, rights, etc., are actually the real normative where the real normative work is done. Yeah, uh, I think that last part is, is really important and persuasive to me because I think I do think that there's some kind of lack of symmetry between the domestic type of case and the global case because of. I think you're right that the problems all have the same kind of structure, but what hits me immediately about taxation as the solution, at least when we're talking about the US, which is obviously a fulcrum of <laughs> much of the inequality that you're talking about, is just that um, talking about taxation with regard to domestic policy is talking about greater like popular control, but talking about taxation with regard to foreign policy with the structure of our government is talking about handing money over to political elites. So that was, I think, part of the thing that was motivating my question too, is just the thought that I I do, I mean, not like I totally trust it, but I think when we think about, yeah, about taxation for domestic programs, it's clear that it should be subject to some kind of um, popular control, but the way that the US makes foreign policy is not subject yeah, to any yeah. kind of popular yeah. control. But you don't have to have the solution, but that's part of what was motivating my yeah. thought. Okay, yeah, I see. Yes, so I, I think you're right in the sense that, um, so this is also why, so, so this also comes back to the distinction between taxation and philanthropy. And, and many of the, <laughs> many political philosophers are very, uh, critical about philanthropy because it has no uh, democratic basis. But actually the reason why I don't want to do all of it away is precisely because our idea of the government in much of political philosophy is too idealized. And um, I mean, the, the cases you give, but also the case of climate. They, I mean, so I think I uh, when I reviewed Rob Reach's book on philanthropy, which very basically says it doesn't have a, it's undemocratic, I said, well, yes, but what about saying funding uh, grassroots organizations that try to make the, the government take into account um, interests that are currently not 
that are not in the democratic system, such as future generations. So I do think some argument about having a balance of power and power and counter power, that could provide an argument for a limited amount of widely distributed philanthropy. And one must find then something similar about the international case that it's not used for geopolitical means. But I mean, also this is not gonna solve everything. That's obvious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for for the talk. That was uh, I also agree with with a lot that was said here. Uh, I just maybe this is not the most interesting question, but I did want to ask whether in the book you have some sort of a proposal on what some of those limits may be uh, for various scarce resources. Uh, and you know, it truly may be just very hard to quantify. I think that looking at that sixth, uh, I think argument about that rich people are not happy even when they have it, there is some psychological research that you know puts a dollar amount, but I'm sure that some other people may say, well, I'm sure that I could be happy if I just had 1 million, just one. Uh, but I just wanted to get some thoughts on, on you know, actually what some of these limits could look like, or if, you know, we just want to focus on, on the values uh, which lead us to, to make these claims. And I also have, you know, some things to say about how private companies, especially the bank I work with for, uh, how we think about pricing our scarce resources, meaning the bank has X amount of limited funding, X amount of business lines, which we could deploy that funding for. And we quantify it by saying, if you, there's a hurdle that you need to meet uh, in order for, you know, us as I work in the treasury division, but like for us to give you that funding to do that business. So there's a different, pretty quantifiable way on how we think about pricing scarce resources uh, that would probably just not apply to some of these large scale issues. But I'll stop right there and just wanted to ask the question about what the limit actually looks like. <laughs> Thanks, thanks. No, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it is, uh, I think nobody should sign up to limitarianism, even if they're uh, attracted by the idea without having not necessarily a precise number, but at least something that will say what the number represents. Uh, because then what are you signing up for? Uh, so I th and the, uh, in the book I defend um, uh, a political threshold which I think uh, we should, as an ideal for what you should try to um, reach by rearranging the institutions, which is both pre-distribution and then taxation. And um, I think in the, in the European context, but this is, here it becomes important, where we have um, healthcare, where we have uh, no private schools, so we have public education, uh, university is like, 2,000 euros a year, um, where you have uh, pension schemes that the employers are obliged to contribute to. So you don't have to save your own savings. You can if you want to have extra. But in that context, I think it you don't. I think it's politically you don't. You could say say 10 million is all you need. In the U.S. context, I I cannot know for sure. Because I do not know how much, for example, it would cost to get two children through uh, university and uh, save up for your pension and, and so on. But I think it, and that's also why I think it should be, it, it's in the end, a political discussion. But there is a second threshold, which is the voluntaristic, where each of us can ask, how much do I need? And actually, some of the, the very wealthy people I've been speaking to they were in that process before I asked them. They were just, I was asking, okay, tell me what are you, what are your thoughts and your considerations? And they were all just deciding for themselves. We have all these millions. 
uh, how, how much should we keep? So they just felt it was too much. And as I said before, I think there are there's selection bias. Um, the people I spoke to were all um, grew up as um, um, middle class people, and then just became rich by uh, entrepreneurial success. And they just they just think they know that they have been having these good lives where they didn't have all that money. And of course, I think it's different if you if you're born into uh, wealth and then have to decide what to do with it. But there we also see, for example, Marlene Engelhorn, a uh, uh, German, the German uh, heiress from the B BASF fortune is now all over the newspapers because she said she's going to give it away. And, and Chuck Collins is an American example. He also gave away his inheritance at age 23 or 25 or so. So I, I do. So I want to really keep this political discussion and this private discussion both together. And but I wonder, what do you think? What no, I, I think that's that makes sense, and I I even think it makes sense to just frame the issue or the problem and highlight the international components. But you know, just practically, it does sound that some of these limits may be. Uh, the country specific or or you know based on x y other number of factors that are specific to to some other places but uh yeah i well yeah i i think i agree just generally with with the response but i'll pass the microphone to someone can i just make one one small um yeah, well, one, one small comment. So there is um, uh, um, Rachel Sherman, who is a professor of sociology at the New School. She's written this book a couple of years ago called An Easy Street, where she has she's uh, interviewed uh, uh, high net wealth, well, high net worth, but some of these scholars want to call it high net wealth um, uh, in, uh, families in New York. And and when what what they, how they decide uh, about their consumption and 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 savings and and giving away patterns, and often they are, and often they say things like, and what now if we lose this job and one of us falls ill, then we need to have those millions, and that is of course why you need health insurance for everybody. I mean, if you have health insurance for every, so I I mean. If if I if I don't think actually I personally need any savings, because I have health insurance which is affordable, and my kids go to public schools and they're great, and I have a pension that both the state and my employer save for me. So why do I need money? It's nice to have a little bit for when I'm retired and I want to do traveling, but I don't need to save hundred thousands. And that of course is a different world where you your security depends on saving. But then we go back to very old arguments from economics that this is inefficient. It's much more efficient to, to pool those risks and hence to have uh, social security. Well, the technical term is social security here. It may mean something else, but, and uh, yeah. So these are the bigger debates that I actually think are, and I think this resonates also a bit with Serene's question that are actually much more important, but uh, yeah. So, I hope we can have them. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a rather, uh, um, you would maybe call it theory-driven question. Um, I was wondering, um, especially with the international context, but maybe also with like an intergenerational context, whether you would need to um, kind of adjust the limitarian threshold or like your whole limitarian theory in a sense that you don't only account for individuals. So people who are have money over the, like the richest line or have surplus money um but also for collectives or for instance for businesses which you've been talking about but also for instance like i mean if you would extend it to the intergenerational level um maybe even a whole generation which is using up more resources than they need for flourishing and just yeah what do you think about that like extending the whole thing to collectives and then how that Kind of had to look in inside your theory. 
Yes, thank you. That that's a, a, a very interesting question. And I um, on the um, generate on the uh, question about generations. Um, um, I'm, I've edited the book, but it's not uh, published yet. Um, where Tim Myers, who is at Leiden University, who works on inter intergenerational question, questions and inter intergenerational justice, has posed some challenges for limitarianism based from, on intergenerational justice questions. So I do think definitely, uh, if you are, uh, say, really uh, within, within political philosophy and within theories, I do not doubt there are all sorts of issues. And I've, I've come to, and this is also something that that Tim also um, uh, ex expresses that he says, there may be a sort of a trade-off between what limitarianism can do theoretically and what it can do as a more, how should we call this, pragmatic theory-based vision that is less neat or less clean as a theory, uh, but, might, for example, be something that many, the, many many other theories could all subscribe to. So it may actually have more power in practice or in as a as an ideal in practice, and less in theory, or else you develop it into another direction. But then he says it's actually going to lose some of its uh, value for for uh, uh, on a pragmatic ground. So I think there are interesting thoughts there. So um, on um, on um, generations, yes, I do think that current generations are definitely taking too much. So the the, the way in which some of these, um, um, so I do think that at least conceptually, you can definitely say that certain that, that generations shouldn't take more than what. Um, other generations can then have. And what's difficult about these arguments is that you have ecological resources, and we now know they are depleting very rapidly, but you also have um, assumptions about um, innovation and possible further increases in uh, standards of living, and then you have to weigh those off. And I just think that often there's, there's too much weight being put and too much optimism about uh, future standards of living, and then the, and then some arguments say, yeah, but we it's fine if we keep polluting because future generations will just have much higher welfare because they have all this uh, more money and they will have more technology. But I just think it depends. And this then you see again it goes back to your question: What's your account of quality of life? And can you can, are these different goods, uh, ecological resources and material resources, are they commensurable or not? So lots of interesting theoretical questions. <laughs> Thanks. I have to follow up on his first question, which was with respect to what he called collectives. Um, I mean, pre presumably, um, our uh, solution should be confront the real problems. And I liked a lot about what you said about the actual global situation with respect to structural uh, functioning of capitalism. And it, you know, from a, a sort of more, um, I guess, critical perspective, one, one could say that just addressing these incomes or their wealth of these few people doesn't get at the root problem, which is the unlimited accumulation that's ingredient in the functioning of of capitalist um, exploitation and glo through, through globalization in the present. So it would seem to be just kind of, you know, um, remedying a little bit the surface of things. So not juxtaposing limitarianism to egalitarianism or sufficientarianism, but even in terms of whether it's addressing the root problems. Yeah. Wouldn't it always be trying to just catch up and wouldn't it be just sort of limited to superficial a level because even if you're going to be taxing the rich basically or whatever the uh, you know it doesn't get at the root problem yes and but, are you going to yeah. acknowledge that in the book or well, is that no just... but i acknowledge this already in the papers i've written because uh you can make exactly the same uh critique slash questions to uh sufficientarianism and poverty uh 
I mean, you yeah. can say, well, yes, let's uh, um, relieve, do something about poverty, but not address the structural problems. So I think, um, first of all, uh, in, in the more theoretical slash technical papers, I say very explicitly that this is just a partial account of this of what the distribution should look like. I think it should, in any case, come with uh, also some uh, minimal threshold. It would be absurd to just say we shouldn't have any rich people and we don't care about what what else happens. That would be an absurd theory. Mm. So it so it is in any case a piece that comes into a bigger theory. But um, so far, but but I think much of the debates about uh, distribution distributive justice over the last decades uh, were uh, either just going into more depth about uh, all sorts of technical details, or there was uh, in the, the first 10 years, well, around the, the millennium turn, there was a big debate about different versions of equality of opportunity, but you don't know what they mean in practice. And I also think these debates are too far away from structural analyses and from empirical work. Empirical work. Right. But even uh, just uh, so there are two questions. First of all, uh, the questioner was also asking about whether there's an Im implication for businesses themselves or for capital. It should is the idea of limitari limitarianism applicable to them. That would be one thing. But also there's the standard. Well, it's not standard. The non-standard critique of distributive justice is that it's not looking at the organization of production. Yeah. And it's just dealing with the consequences. So yeah. I'm just wondering what you would say more substantively about the, yeah. you know, what we can do about changing the organization of production yeah. so that it isn't aiming at unlimited accumulation. Yeah. So the, I actually think um, this is, of course, a, a personal view, but I think this critique is no longer, uh, I think it has become standard. Yeah. That the that the district. I mean, with definitely with yeah, but work. not take. But it does. I mean, yeah. I think it. Yeah, you have the roles in. You know. Yeah, but prop, But it's got to go beyond that. Absolutely, but I think definitely with the work by people like Iris Marion Young, this has now become mainstream. That it's not just about uh, the surface, but that one really needs to look at the structures. But uh, so, and I agree. But the thing is, of course, if you want to, so I want to do a kind of philosophy that, on the one hand. Um, uses some of these uh, ways of reasoning from more analytic, but I put it between quotes, type of philosophy that I think are helpful. But on the other hand, that has really does something in the world in which we are. And I think looking at um, excessive wealth is, of course, it's also a way where you enter a debate that is that already exists. And um, I the, my worry about egalitarianism is although I am some sort of egalitarian too, is that uh, it also means very different things to people, but not just about, because what equality, equality of outcome, to equality of opportunity, you can have very flimsy liberals that are egalitarians, and then you can have uh, full socialists that are egalitarians. Well, it's quite a big difference. So, but I totally agree with you that it should, that the, the, um, so you what what I want this idea of limitarianism to be is something that could be one building block in a vision that people develop of how they think about their good society. And I that's was, really what I was also yeah. thinking you should get Elizabeth Warren to endorse your book. <laughs> well, if some of you know her, <laughs> get that's me in touch. Rich. I think if I had a critique, you sort of easily go back and forth between wealthy individuals and institutions. And in the way you're talking about them, they seem almost equivalent, and they're really, really not. Wealth is an abstraction, especially in those wealthy individuals, Bezos and Musk. And more. Mm -hmm. They're just their share, how many shares they have, mm -hmm. times the stock price on the stock market. They can't actually do any much, very much with that money unless they sold those shares yeah. and then they did something with the money. So the wealth is an abstraction. Institutional wealth, like who, you, you seem sanguine about your ability to get your pension payouts for the rest of your life. Somebody's investing that pension. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that's vested in institutions and banks and other things 
the individual wealth is dwarfed by those mm -hmm. institutions and the people who are in those institutions making those investment decisions i was one of them i was at one time investing hundreds of million dollars for tiaa cref and i had a responsibility to people like carol mm -hmm. who were going to get their pension payouts for that for the next x year okay <laughs> well the fiduciary yeah. responsibilities in doing the best transfer price. I have an MBA from NYU. We were taught transfer pricing as part of a good tax strategy. Mm -hmm. And if we did not lower our taxes by billing each other across continents, it was malfeasance yeah. of our leadership role. Yeah. So that's pretty embedded in what is called fiduciary responsibility by the people who actually run these numbers. So Addressing a few wealthy individuals cannot be conflated with addressing the institutions that actually control trillions and trillions of dollars of yeah. wealth. And they have no such compunction. Their responsibility is to the shareholders or the pension holders, not benevolence in some other yeah. way. So I think you cannot equate the two. You yeah. can't start with a list of billionaires and then start talking about a company. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. No, thank you. That's that's a I actually thank you for this comment, and I I agree with you. And but so the the question is, the sort of questions. One, the, there's institutions and individuals, and there is billionaires and very rich people, but who do not necessarily have political power. And I'm trying to um, address all of them. And you could of course say this is. This is uh, it's better to focus. I think it's it's a, val a valid uh, strategy in the in the in the book, but also, for example, in the work by by Piketty, he makes a distinction distinction between the when it goes about individuals, not about institutions, between the the wealthy and I don't know more which terms used, but for example, London-based groups call them the super rich because the, that already is a relevant difference. And then there's, a, of course, also institutions versus individuals. But I think Saez and Zuckman also made a good point, which is it's in the end, all, also these institutions are full with individuals. Of course, they have to work within the law, but there's also people who make the law. So there are all these connections. And this is what makes it also so difficult because we can imagine changes in the law, for example, that you do not only have to have this duty towards the pension holders, but also towards you're allowed to think about future generations and hence not go for the highest return, but for a limited basket of investments. But then the law has to change. Who changes the law? Lawmakers. Where do the lawmakers come from? Voters. So you see, these are all people. So on the one hand, they all have very little power. On the other hand, it's also not the case that there are no people. And that is, I think, a tricky thing that we have in the whole of political theory. I, I think we, we 